so um, very well welcome to everybody. In, um, next webinar, what the fucking are from us. Um, and yeah, this time we will have Marshall on stage. But about that, I'll tell you in a second. Um, first, couple of um, couple of stuff you need to know. So um, house keeping. Um, this session will be uh, recorded and you will get a recording on, on the email as, as Teresa already mentioned, it will be on YouTube. Um, please also follow our code of conduct. The link will be shared in the chat, but the short version is basically let's be nice to each other. Um, and yeah, don't be shy. Feel free to unmute yourself if we have questions. Uh, feel free to drop questions on the chat as well. Um, after the talk, Marcel will uh, will answer all of them, hopefully. So, a um, couple of announcements from our side. Um, you get a chance as well to get a free copy of our Cloud-Native Transformation book. Um, I'll tell you, I read it one and a half times. Um, started reading it second time. Um, didn't finish yet, but um, yeah, it's it's pretty nice book, and I'm saying that not only because I work for Container Solutions. It's it's really nice, especially if you are interested in uh, in this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, um, check out the links. Um, you can download it for free. Um, and most importantly, it is time um, we have something cool uh, coming soon on um, August twenty two. Um, that's not when the conference is on August 22. You have the deadline until you until that you can send a um, proposal for the talk for our conference. Um, and this conference will be something else than what you may expect. Uh, we call it a hybrid conference because we'll be talking not only about technology but also about everything else that relates to cloud native transformation. And this is, I would say, really important because um, from my personal professional experience as, as a cloud native consultant. Most of the time when we do cloud native transformations and, 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 and with clients, um, the technical challenges are the easiest to solve. Um, what's usually the most difficult is to change people's minds and make their restructure in the company and basically make sure that that technological change um, has actually, actually makes sense. So that's what the conference will be about. Um, Feel free to send your talk. Um, oh yeah, last but not least, uh, we are hiring. Uh, we are a bunch of nice people and it, it's pretty cool to work for Container Solutions, um, I'll be honest. Um, so feel free to, to, to drop to our um, careers page um, or even drop me drop me a message on, on Twitter or on email if you want to know some more inside details about working for Container Solutions. Okay, um, and now before we go to Marcel's talk, we have um, some gossips to talk about. Adrian, the stage is yours. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I got three items here. The first one is the walkout at Blizzard. Um, so this has been all over the internet. So I suspect a lot of people, are, a lot of you, are aware of this. Um, basically the employees have started walkouts and also other people have been doing stuff in solidarity all across Twitter. Uh, and the demands are to improve conditions for employees at the company, especially women and in particular women of color and transgender women, non-binary people and other marginalized groups. Basically it follows a couple of weeks ago, um, the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing uh, had a two year investigation that found widespread sexist harassment retaliation and discrimination, uh, and that Blizzard fostered a, a sexist culture in which female employees and less than males were doing similar work. Um, yeah, and if you look on online, you'll find some examples and it's, yeah, I think it's a lot of it describes it as frat boy behavior. And I think that's fairly accurate. Um, it certainly seems pretty unacceptable. Um, perhaps the thing that really sort of caused the walkouts though was the, the company response. So um, originally, like the, I don't know the CEO, I can't remember who it was at the company, but they basically said, no, these, this isn't true. It's distorted, in many cases, false descriptions of Blizzard's past uh, and described the lawsuit as truly meritless and irresponsible. Um, but of course, then you had all the former and current employees saying, well, actually, there is some truth to this. Um, and 
they really wanted, uh, I guess, an apology. And instead, they got people doubling down, and that led to the walkout. Um, so um, personally, I, I do wish them all the best for the walkout, and I, I hope they uh, um, do make some changes at Blizzard. OK, the CO2 selector at Google. This is um, pretty cool. We try and keep on top of some of the, the green news here at um, Container Solutions. Um, so basically, uh, if you run in Google and you're using Google Cloud Run um, and some of the other ones, uh, they're rolling out to more and more uh, features of Google Cloud over time. But at the minute, Google Cloud Run, at least, allows you to, to select regions with the lowest CO2 label. So they mark certain regions, and if you choose one of them, I think it's got a little green leaf next to it, uh, those are the ones with the lowest CO2. Now, it's a little bit complicated what that means. I will read it to you. Um, regions marked with the lowest CO2 label have a CFE percentage of at least 75%, um, where CFE is the average percentage of carbon-free energy consumed in a per particular location on an hourly basis. So it doesn't seem that it's completely carbon neutral, but it's at least a, a forward step. Um, and oh, it also says, or grid carbon intensity of maximum 200 GCO2 EQ over kilowatt hour. Um, I'm afraid I can't tell you what that is. It's something to do with ca grid carbon intensity is the average life cycle gross emissions per unit of energy from the grid. So there you go. Um, but yeah, I just want to, to point that out. So if you are running in Google, you can go and have a look at that and possibly move your, your workloads to a, a greener area. And there are ones in both Europe and the, the States. Um, OK, the final point. Uh, this is quite an interesting one. So both Google and Facebook have recently announced that for employees to return to offices, they are going to require them to be vaccinated. Um, now, Google has delayed um, going back to the office till October, and this partially follows Twitter. So Twitter um, did open its offices, and apparently they required everybody to be vaccinated. But regardless of that, they had a large outbreak of COVID, and they shut their offices again. Um, but whichever way you look at this, it's going to be controversial, I think. Uh, there's lots of inter interesting questions, like how do people prove They've been vaccinated. Are all vaccines okay or only some of them? Do you need one dose? Do you need two doses? Um, excuse me. And what about people who can't get the vaccine? Or And then, of course, the people that just won't get the vaccine. Um, I guess for the people that won't get it, they, they may just have to go elsewhere for employment or work remotely. Yeah, um, so that's a goss. Is there any comments or questions? Normally, Jamie says something inappropriate at this point. True, very true. <laughs> but he's on holidays. Okay. <laughs> I mean, wasn't it in the handover, David, of the inappropriate page of things <laughs> to say? <laughs> Oops, that's my bad. Okay, well, back to the office okay. then. Thank you. Um, all right, so um, if no more comments then let's get to the point of this uh, what the fucking hell um so we'll be talking about what the fuck is cluster api today um pretty cool topic because the cluster api is getting some traction i would say in in, in, in cloud native world so i'm um, curious myself about the talk so um marcel how are you doing ready for the talk yeah hey thank you yeah i'm very well um i'm excited to talk about cluster api and share my views kind of um, and also explain basically what, what is cluster API from a little bit of a higher level. So just starting out right away, we are not going to be talking about like the super technical details because even though they are quite interesting, I think as you mentioned also, you have your um, cloud native transition book and so on. A lot of people and a lot of organizations are kind of in this cloud native transition and in this phase where they really need a high level overview and a high level understanding of what, what are some of the implications, not only for your technical stack, but your entire organization when you go cloud native. And a cluster API kind of fits into this picture from a view of you're transitioning to Kubernetes, but now you're scaling up your Kubernetes usage. What, what tends to happen and what are the learnings that the community has made? It makes sense, yeah. So um, yeah, 
So to, 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 to our audience, feel free to, to drop the questions on the chat um, or ask afterwards. And now, Marcel, the stage is yours. Thank you. I'm sharing my screen, I hope. Let me know. Yep. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, yeah, so like I just said, we're going to be talking about cluster API. I want to start out really briefly with who, who the fuck am I, basically. This is the, the first what the fuck in this talk. Um, I'm Marcel Müller. I'm a platform engineer at GiantSwarm. Um, at GiantSwarm, we are a managed Kubernetes provider. And then my role is to mostly work on Kubernetes operators, as well as now working on cluster API upstream. Um, also, that work is currently a little bit more conceptual, but I've also contributed to upstream and I've actually worked on cluster API quite a bit. And from that, my experience with cluster API, I would say is pretty in depth, um, not only in like the theoretical part, but also in using it and working with it as like a developer. Today in the talk, as I mentioned, I want to focus more on a higher level. So this is not going to be super technical, but it's more going to be out of the perspective of a decision maker. So imagine yourself if you're not Imagine if you are even better <laughs> as a decision maker in the um, cloud native space. And then I'd like to start out with a story I've seen over and over again um, in our customers and in the community um, regarding how cluster or how Kubernetes usage grows in certain organization. So we start off in your organization, for example, with a team that really wants to start using um, Kubernetes or has started using Kubernetes. And for whatever reason, they have chosen AWS to be their provider. So the basic idea is the team has the agency to decide they want to use Kubernetes for their workload. They start using Kubernetes and they now start using Kubernetes on AWS, maybe even EKS. Um, so far, so good, right? That's not a problem for anyone. They can do this. Now, a different team in your organization might decide to use Azure instead and start using Kubernetes on Azure. Well, now we have suddenly two providers, still shouldn't be a problem. Both of them are using Kubernetes and, and, and to an extent, we now see kind of their differences happening. So for example, on AWS, you might use some AWS CLI to manage your cluster. On Azure, you might uh, use some Azure CLI. You might use EKS on AWS. You might use AKS on Azure. So you really start to see there's a divergence happening in my organization. Well, it gets even more interesting now when we decide to also have Kubernetes on-premise. So we're adding an on-premise installation of Kubernetes and suddenly we have three providers. We have AWS, Azure, and maybe VMware on-premise. And now in your organization, you will really start to see differences because each one of these providers is inherently not the same. While each one of them might be running Kubernetes, the cluster management will be different. What that means is, for example, upgrading a cluster on AWS will most likely be pretty much completely different than upgrading a cluster on your VMware installation. And to an extent, it will also be different in the entire lifecycle management. So you will use different tools to manage your lifecycle. There will be different overlays by the different providers to manage your lifecycle. And what you start realizing is, oh no, we now have an organization where we wanted Kubernetes as kind of like this equal point in our organization where everyone can deploy and it's all kind of the same. And we're starting to realize it's not the same at all. We need to have operational knowledge for AWS, for Azure, for on-premise, and all of this operational knowledge is starting to slow us down and bear us down. And if incidents happen, suddenly the incidents are very AWS specific because maybe you're also using the AWS CNI. And now this is completely different than from any other provider. But thankfully it gets even worse. So we have talked about how bad it can already get with like uh, multiple providers in the current state, but it gets a little bit worse when you get into the mindset of, um, I want to actually have some level of overview or control of what is happening. And the first point you might run into is which Kubernetes versions are we running? If you're an organization with hundreds of clusters, which is not uncommon in larger organizations, it can be extremely hard in a very diverse environment to just figure out which Kubernetes versions are we running. And this has very bad security implement, uh, implications. If you don't know which Kubernetes versions you're running, you don't know which CVEs you're exposed to. 
and which se severity they might have. So you start to realize this is getting worse and you can't easily like take a ruler and make it all even because the providers in themselves are not the same. And then you run into the problem of metadata. Um, metadata can be attached depending on the providers differently. So for example, on AWS, you might have your clusters tagged with a team that the cluster belongs to. So it's reasonably easy to discover which team owns this cluster, who's the responsible person for this cluster. But if you have multiple providers, you will need to add an additional abstraction layer to kind of abstract away all this complexity that you're suddenly adding to your Kubernetes usage, because you might not be able to tag your Kubernetes clusters the same way on VMware or the same way on Azure. So all of this kind of amplifies the problem that even though we wanted just Kubernetes and it should be the same everywhere, when we manage the life cycle of Kubernetes, suddenly it's not the same anymore. And it's also not the same anymore from an organizational point of view, because we can't extract the same data in the same way from all of our providers. So let's think about some solutions we can, we can come up with, um, so some simple solutions that in my personal experience, some of the companies go for. Um, so how can we solve this problem? Let's start off. We could, as a company or as an organization, we could decide, let's go all in on one cloud provider. We just put every Kubernetes cluster we have on AWS, for example. So every cluster we have has to be an EKS cluster. This has some wide ranging implications and problems. Um, so why, why should you not do this? <laughs> Number one would be, obviously it solves a lot of the problems, but you're locking yourself into AWS. So suddenly you're very reliant on your cloud provider or your provider of choice. Um, we have seen this, or I've personally seen this with Azure where organizations have locked themselves in very hard on Azure on like a pricing calculation, because there was a time where you got very steep discounts on Azure. So organizations would lock themselves in very hard. Then those discounts just suddenly stop because Azure also realizes you're, you're locked in now. You can't get out easily anymore. All your pricing benefit you had suddenly vanishes away and you're now stuck on Azure. Additionally, there might be other reasons why you want um, multi-provider support. Some providers are not available in some regions. For example, if you need to do something in, in China, you will have a hard time figuring out how to get a, a Kubernetes cluster from um, Microsoft in China. This is kind of a problem that will then follow you once you make this decision. So let's say we don't go all in into one cloud provider. The second point we could make is let's centralize all our cluster management in one team. So instead of teams being able to decide themselves where they may be provision a cluster or give them the agency um, to do this, we decide we have one central team in our organization. This central team has the complete power over where clusters run, which clusters run, which versions they are in. And basically they're like the complete masters of the Kubernetes usage in your organization. Um, Obviously, this is another solution you can go for. But once again, it comes with some implications, which in my opinion, are quite negative. First of all, in a DevOps world where the mentality you build it, you run it, should be lived, with this move, you will create a quasi ops team in your organization that will, in the end, be responsible for running certain stuff and you will take this agency away from your development teams. This then brings more problems that you will get like kind of a blame culture because now developers and applications team might start blaming the central cluster management team for whichever problems they have. In my opinion, it's always beneficial to give the development team as much as possible uh, control over where they actually deploy and how they deploy. And this is the complete inverse from that. And now finally, um, the final solution could be, let's just build custom tooling around all cases we have. So we saw there are lots of differences here. Let's just build custom tooling that kind of makes it all equal. So we can build maybe a CLI, which collects all the data from all different providers that we possibly might be running. And we build it customly. And then we have an abstraction layer, which we just build ourselves and maintain ourselves. 
And yeah, I can tell you from my own experience, this is not a good idea because you will fall behind um, to the cloud providers and to the open source solutions because an open source solution is very interesting because the open source community is working on it and they will overtake you if you build such custom solutions for cluster management and for uh, Kubernetes cluster management. And therefore, in the long run, you might not be such well off as you might think immediately because you run into the situation that you need to continuously maintain this code and continuously maintain this complexity. So what could we do instead? We could think about standardizing cluster management. So how about we just standardize cluster management across all providers and therefore we theoretically don't have these problems anymore. And this is kind of what cluster API aims at. It's in a sense, a standardization of Kubernetes cluster management. And that brings us directly to the question, what is cluster API or what is the cluster API project on like a higher level? First of all, we can just talk about the, <laughs> the basics. It's a, a Kubernetes sub project started by SIG cluster lifecycle. So it's a project that is started by Kubernetes themselves or by the Kubernetes community themselves where the Kubernetes community decided, hold on, <laughs> there's a gap here. We see this problem of all these different providers. Therefore, let's do something about it. And with that, the cluster API um, sub project will start. It's driven um, by a community of individual contributors and companies. This means same as any other project in a CNCF. It's not driven by a single company or it's not driven by a single person. It is uh, basically a steering committee or like a set of reviewers that are from different companies from within the um, community. And we can now also see what Cluster API themselves claim what they are. And that is basically Cluster API is a Kubernetes sub project focused on providing declarative APIs and tooling to simplify provisioning, upgrading and operating multiple Kubernetes clusters. The parts I marked in red here are to me currently the most important parts, okay? We are not only managing create or, or not only dealing with creating Kubernetes clusters where we maybe have good solutions. We're talking about the full set of cluster lifecycle management, which goes from provisioning through upgrading and operating. And we want this all for multiple Kubernetes clusters across hopefully multiple providers. Cool. So far, so good. Let's go a little bit deeper and ask ourselves, well, we talked about, we want to standardize now cluster management, but how do we even go about standardizing cluster management? Um, if you've ever tried to standardize anything, like I had a discussion yesterday, for example, I'm gonna go on a slight side tangent. Um, so a tortoise is a type of turtle. How do you standardize what even is a tortoise then? So because like a tortoise, it doesn't have flippers, it has weird legs. Do they just have in common, they have a shell, but then what is what else would fall under a, a tortoise, right? Or a turtle. So if you think about it, it can become very difficult very quickly. And therefore standardization is usually very hard. And this is also true for Kubernetes cluster management. In this case, Kubernetes cluster management has gone through multiple iterations inside cluster API. And I'm gonna talk about basically the latest one here. So firstly, Cluster API tries to standardize interfaces for components. What does this mean? We're talking about components of a Kubernetes cluster. So we're trying to standardize, for example, what is actually a cluster at the smallest scope. And we're trying to standardize what is a machine at the smallest scope. Like what about a cluster is the same on all providers that is relevant to um, Kubernetes cluster management. What about a machine is the same across all providers? So we're trying to find common abstractions that are true in any case where you run a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and, and Cluster API has come up with these, for example, for a cluster, for machine deployment, for machine, for machine pool, for several different things that are just universally true and therefore are generic definitions of, for example, a cluster. And then additionally, Cluster API attempts to abstract away some of the complexity we had previously by introducing easy to um, implement interfaces for infrastructure providers. So what we're trying to do is 
We're trying to take the common parts of a Kubernetes cluster and keep them common and take the provider specific parts of a Kubernetes cluster and make them easily replaceable so that when we have a different provider, we just need to replace this one specific part instead of having all these dependencies going on. And there it's quite important that um, cluster API kind of gives you a generic type um, that simply references these provider specific implementations or, or types. And these provider specific types um, are well defined through an interface so that every provider can basically implement them. So when you look at these, they are uh, I don't want to show like the Go code right now, but they are very high level. So, so in those uh, interfaces, there's not much about anything provider specific. It's more general information that is true in this specific context. What does this look like now when we take like from a 10,000 foot view? So I, I kind of simplified this extremely to just have the very core basic uh, cluster API components and talk about how we can switch them out. We have the core component. This core component contains only our generic um, definitions and actions for Kubernetes cluster management. And everything else is replaceable. So what cluster API ended up doing is we have one component that is the same no matter the Kubernetes cluster. And then we have several other components which we can exchange. And this starts to make sense when you start looking at the infrastructure um, provider because we want to switch out the infrastructure and to have a cluster run on AWS, I would simply use the infrastructure provider AWS. If I want to run a cluster on Azure, I can switch out this infrastructure provider and instead use the Azure infrastructure provider without touching anything else. I can keep my bootstrap the same. I can keep my control plane management the same and the core always stays the same. So this kind of simplifies um, managing clusters on different providers by really abstracting out what makes them different. Now, just defining different types is not enough. Um, there are some operations which are always the same across different clusters. And Cluster API also tries to define these and tries to standardize these. So these operations can be how clusters created, like what's the order of uh, cluster creation. Um, there will first be a control plane. Once the control plane is up, then the worker nodes will drop. Stuff like this is getting um, standardized through cluster API. So this is kind of standardized workflows for cluster creation, deletion, and updating, as well as standardized rollout methods. Um, for example, through machine deployments, how your nodes are going to be rolled and which tolerances you have. You can kind of take a comparison here. A machine deployment is, in this case, similar to a pod deployment, right? The underlying difference is a machine deployment acts on machines. A pod deployment acts on pods. So you can kind of see how this is similar here and also how um, we follow concepts that are already established by Kubernetes also in Cluster API. Now I talked a lot about how this abstraction looks like and why this abstraction was made. Let's talk about who currently is using this abstraction because I think this is quite interesting to understand where Cluster API is going and where it's going to establish itself. Currently, Cluster API has tried to self-define like its use case driven personas. Um, and very interesting in these use case driven personas is the most important persona right now, there's more, but the most important one is managed Kubernetes providers. So cluster API is currently designed for managed Kubernetes providers, which want to basically rely on this automation and have cluster API as a basis for Kubernetes cluster management. This also means in return that if you're an organization that wants to expand their um, um, Kubernetes usage, there's two ways you can go right now. You can either choose a managed Kubernetes provider that then will implement cluster API, or you can implement cluster API yourself and take the, a different route. But currently in the community, the difference is that the managed Kubernetes providers are the ones where the most focus lies on. So who are these managed Kubernetes providers? Well, it's for example, um, oh, 
sorry. It's for example, VMware, um, VMware Tanzu, I believe, was built on cluster API. It's now also project Pacific inside VMware. I'm not a VMware employee, so I don't know exactly the difference. I'm sorry. Um, Microsoft Azure, um, where they currently still have AKS, but they are investing a lot of time in cluster API to slowly go from the AK AKS engine towards cluster API, Google Cloud, and Red Hat. So you will see from all of these different um, companies a lot of contributors in cluster API who want to use cluster API in their own managed solutions, obviously. From here, we can now talk about, okay, why? <laughs> why do they want to use this? And what does it mean uh, for you, right? If, if um, AWS or um, Azure wants to start using cluster API, then what does that actually mean for you? And why do they think it's beneficial? We can firstly talk about, from your perspective, about reduced vendor lock-in. This means, number one, that switching between infrastructure providers becomes easier. As I've shown, earlier, the infrastructure provider part in cluster API becomes fully replaceable. You can take the infrastructure provider out and switch a different one in um, and start and manage clusters with uh, the different infrastructure provider. That kind of means that previously, cluster management tooling was very much catered to specific infrastructure providers. Um, for example, we at GiantSwarm before cluster API also implemented our own cluster management. And it was very custom to how Giant Swarm operates. That meant in return that from Giant Swarm managed Kubernetes, it was not straightforward to switch to, for example, EKS. And in return, it's also not very straightforward currently, for example, to switch from EKS to VMware because, or, or manage Tanzu, because the abstractions are just not the same. With cluster API, these abstractions become more equal, and therefore switching between managed Kubernetes uh, offerings becomes easier. Because first of all, it's easier to compare them now, as cluster API builds like a basis that's kind of the same. And second of all, um, there's a higher familiarity between different providers, because different providers will still use the same concepts, and the concept in this case being cluster API. And therefore, it becomes a lot easier. So we have two ways to reduce vendor lock-in with cluster API as an end consumer. Number one, we can switch out the infrastructure provider much easier. And number two, the managed Kubernetes offerings are just easier to compare and easier to switch between. Well, so let's talk about the next strategic point. So we talked about reduced vendor lock-in and that's kind of fine for us um, if we ever need to switch vendor or need to make um, some deliberations, this becomes easier. Another point is cluster API as a building block now. We've talked about how cluster API builds out these uh, generic types. And what's really interesting now is with these interfaces and types, we can build on top of them. And this is a very big strategic point that cluster API is trying to push. They want cluster API parts and components to be your basis to build applications on top of them. For example, we had previously the example, this is the, the simplest example. We had the example of you just want to count how many clusters you have. Um, if you're using 10 different providers and each one has a different representation, it's really hard to count your clusters suddenly. With cluster API, each one of these clusters will have the representation of a cluster CR in this case, which is the same on each provider. So counting it is suddenly provider independent. Just count how many KP cluster instances there are and you've done it. Very easy point, but kind of drives home the point that you can build now functionality on top of a cluster API, which is completely provider independent. Additionally, higher logic, such as uh, cluster auto scaling, can be implemented provider independent by using cluster API types. Now, this might come to a surprise to some of you, but the implementation for cluster auto scaler is not provider, implement, um, provider agnostic. If you look in the current cluster autoscaler code upstream, so Kubernetes cluster autoscaler, um, it, is, it has different implementations from providers. Um, with cluster API, you can drill this down to just having an implementation for Kubernetes cluster autoscaling on top of cluster API. And it therefore becomes a lot easier. Um, obviously, you will have the slides available afterwards, but it's 
um, in here. Next, we then have an example from us, from Giant Storm, what we did kind of um, as like a point of how to do this. Um, we managed each of our clusters with Prometheus. Each of our managed clusters is um, being targeted by Prometheus to get metrics on like, is it doing fine? And with cluster API, we were able to make this completely provider independent by having a Prometheus meta operator, which creates Prometheus for the different clusters simply by knowing that a cluster exists, I can have the generic types. I have enough information in my generic cluster type that I can completely independent of providers spin up a Prometheus automatically without any human intervention and monitor my cluster on any provider. And this is really powerful because you're kind of abstracting away all this complexity and was a really good step for us. Now we talked about building blocks and we talked about um, the reduced vendor lock-in. Let's talk about one thing that is more on like the bleeding edge, not really bleeding edge anymore, but it's a very hyped up topic, which is GitOps currently and how cluster API can work together with GitOps to make your organization really, let's say GitOps native or like more GitOps than before. Um, here we see a, a little um, graph, which we need to be a little bit more technical now to explain how this works together with GitOps, but bear with me, um, where we have the management cluster and some workload clusters. What is the difference between a management cluster and a workload cluster? Previously, I've shown you that there are different components in cluster API, and these different components have different um, meaning. So for example, there's the core component, and there's the infrastructure component, bootstrap component, and so on. All of these components run inside Kubernetes itself. So there's a management cluster which runs all of your Kubernetes management basically in cluster API. So imagine these as applications running inside a management cluster where this cluster is now doing the lifecycle management of your workload clusters. So the workload cluster is basically the cluster that goes out to your teams. This means you can have workload clusters on different um, providers while having one management cluster which contains all the management tools for cluster API. So far, so good. Where this becomes awesome is that cluster API is implemented fully through Kubernetes operators, which means you can define your entire Kubernetes cluster through declarative configuration and custom resources. Um, custom resources should be known to about everyone by now, I think. Um, imagine if you want to have a Prometheus or Prometheus operator, you just create a Prometheus custom resource. Here, you just create custom resources for your cluster, where like one of the custom resources is literally just cluster, which is the uh, provider independent part. And applying these custom resources will then through automation spin up the actual cluster. What this enables for you is to have GitOps tooling in front of your management cluster where you can have your entire cluster management and your entire cluster um, infrastructure reflected in Git and through your GitOps tooling. Now, this is extremely powerful because this allows you to integrate with GitOps tooling directly and in a more thorough level than just focusing on your applications. So in a lot of cases, um, GitOps is used mainly for, we want to manage our applications through GitOps and maybe our Kubernetes resources. Here you can additionally now start managing your entire Kubernetes cluster landscape in your organization through GitOps, which is, in my opinion, a step beyond what is possible in other um, configurations. So this, in addition, allows um, your teams themselves to define their clusters in a safe and re uh, reviewable way. These are two of the main uh, benefits of um, GitOps that it's reviewable, that it's like a common process and all these process improvements happen. And you can now transfer these improvements to actual requesting of Kubernetes clusters and requesting of Kubernetes resources. And therefore you kind of transform not only the application team, but the entire DevOps process to a more GitOps native um, implementation. I hope that kind of speaks to you as a GitOps user. And um, from here, I also want to quickly touch on um, more high level organizational viewpoints. So 
one high level viewpoint was maybe um, the, the reduced vendor lock-in. A different one can be very strategic for your organization and that is um, easier scalability. Organizations with Kubernetes can still struggle quite a bit with scaling out Kubernetes when it comes to multiple providers and multiple regions. What does this mean? We, we have the provider problem mostly locked down now. We can just exchange providers and have an easier time. But also we can have differences in regions between providers. So for example, if you run AWS in China, you will not have the full feature set as you will have with AWS in any other region on the world in the world. And cluster API gives you the benefit that it's a well-tested tooling where stuff like this is already built in. So AWS China is not a problem to manage anymore with um, cluster API. While with other providers, or if you do it yourself, you run into lots of problems. And there I once again can speak from personal experience. There was a time where not even basic features were in AWS China available, which are now thankfully available. Additionally, you can scale up your Kubernetes usage with greater ease and less fear of snowflakes because the cluster management at its core is always the same. So the cluster management solution you use is always going to be the same no matter what the provider. You don't need to go to a different managed provider and risk having a snowflake because, for example, one of your customers decides you need to use a specific cloud provider to um, serve their traffic. Just an example that I know that happens sometimes. Um, and then you run into the problem you now are creating a snowflake in your system. With cluster API, you can limit the snowflake to the general cluster management is still the same. You're just using a different infrastructure provider, which is still a little bit different than all the others, but you're limiting it at least. From here, we come to the final point of why cluster API, in my opinion, is such a great way for your organization to look towards and to keep track of. Um, Cluster API, as I mentioned in the start, is a Kubernetes um, six project of Kubernetes six lifecycle. This means it is not driven by one organization. Let's imagine, for example, um, I can just take Giant Swarm two years ago. We implemented our own cluster management. The problem that happened at this point is any customer that is using our cluster management, or if your organization is using cluster management, that's only developed by a single organization, you're tying yourself to the fate of this organization to an extent, right? Because if, for example, this organization like Giant Swarm would go under and we didn't use cluster API, you would be suddenly stuck with a custom solution that you can't manage yourself anymore. Where with cluster API now, there's multiple um, organizations open, uh, like in the open space and uh, working in an open source solution that give you this vendor independence of easily switching between vendors, even if your managed um, Kubernetes provider might change. So this is really a, a big plus for cluster API. And additionally, as you saw previously, the companies working on it are seriously working on it. It's not just a few developers working on it upstream. It's big organizations that have a vested interest in making cluster API work. And therefore the community upstream is also very responsive and very good to work in. So I can only recommend this um, from a user point of view. So let's revisit our scenario at the start. Uh, at the start. Um, we, had a, we had a point where each provider was kind of different. We had Kubernetes running maybe on multiple providers, but they were all kind of different. Um, we had no overview about the Kubernetes version or where something was running because we didn't have any way to get generic information from the um, Kubernetes cluster without knowing the actual um, provider. And finally, there was uh, metadata which was inconsistent across all providers. Cluster API, in my opinion, mostly solves all of these issues. It reduces the number of differences between cloud providers by basically abstracting away the different um, implementations. It makes it possible for you to have generic information available in the same way across multiple providers without having to worry about um, the individual implementations. 
and it allows you to manage your metadata very consistently across all of this. So by now you might be thinking, okay, all of this sounds amazing. What's the catch? What's the problem we are running into? Where's the, where's the catch in all of this? And unfortunately, there is a few little hooks you can get stuck on. Um, and I want to be very open about that. I don't want you to think I'm somehow uh, shilling cluster API. Um, so number one, you need to have a level of expertise to currently use cluster API directly. If you are not, for example, using it through a managed Kubernetes provider. There are not too many guardrails in cluster API, which means you can seriously destroy your Kubernetes cluster if you don't know what you're doing. Um, kind of, you can delete the wrong part of a, a CR, you can do the wrong uh, action, and suddenly you've destroyed your production cluster. Obviously, um, this is not really what you want to do. So you need to have a level of expertise there. Additionally, the technical understanding can get rather complex. We're working with Kubernetes operators here, and we're working with uh, CRDs and CRD migration quite frequently. Um, and you need to have a relatively thorough understanding of these Kubernetes concepts to work with cluster API currently successfully. Kind of tying into that point is there's currently no easy to use open source web interface. So you need to either use the CLI from cluster API, which is cluster CTL, or the CRDs through whatever tool you use directly. There's no easy to use web interface to just monitor what is happening. Like for example, in Argo CD, it's a GitOps solution, but it still has a web interface to kind of show you what is going on on the GitOps side. This doesn't exist right now for cluster API. So it's a purely implementation focused um, project right now where the user experiment, uh, experience is limited to um, the CLI or the CRDs directly. Um, there's no web interface. And additionally, cluster API is currently in alpha. What this means is there are still rather drastic changes in cluster API. We're currently in cluster API v1 alpha 4. There's going to be most likely v1 alpha 5. So some uh, things are still going to change. You can see this as an extreme negative, or you can see it as an opportunity to get involved and change whatever you want to have changed as well upstream, because currently there are still quite a few moving parts in the upstream definitions. The main point I want to still make here is even though it's a kind of a catch, it's still an alpha, uh, what I can report from personal experiment, experience and from developing cluster API is the stability is comparable, if not better, than some of the release projects, because all the users are very serious about it. It's not a thing. You don't destroy all your customers' Kubernetes clusters uh, just by changing the, the alpha version. And therefore, um, there's quite a bit of um, reliability built in, and also versions are supported for a very long time. So even the alpha versions are supported for more than a year in some cases. So we on alpha three is still getting supported. We on alpha uh, two was supported until last year sometime. So you can imagine that it's not just getting dropped and then you have to migrate on your own. There's quite a bit of support going on. To kind of sum it all up or to sum up um, why I believe in cluster API. Um, and this is more my personal views and obviously <laughs> stuff before is also mostly my personal views, but um, yeah, kind of reiterating here. Um, first of all, as a user of Cluster API and as an organization, you will experience less vendor lock-in through Cluster API. Um, I've kind of shown this through multiple examples where it makes sense for you strategically to choose a, a solution that reduces your, your vendor lock-in. Additionally, there's a very strong community working on the project. So this means the community working on it has a very wide view of the problems and is very um, intensively working on it to the point that they want to make this the best way to manage your Kubernetes cluster. Then the conceptual basis um, is sound, in my opinion. It makes a lot of sense to separate the generic parts out from the provider-specific parts in the way it's currently done in cluster API. It is very intuitive to use. It is quite easy to understand, in my opinion, once you get into it. And it just makes life for me as someone that works for a managed Kubernetes provider easier because these abstractions just 
make everything so much nicer to work with for the end user, for the person that is actually managing Q the Kubernetes clusters, and also for anyone that's building applications on top of managed Kubernetes clusters. And with that, I think I was a little bit too fast, but with that, I would like to yeah, open up the round on um, yeah, any questions, any feedback, um, whatever you want to know, I would, I would be very happy to share. We can also look at some of the upstream documentation if you want, but yeah. Great. Um, thank you very much, Moser. It's good that you are a bit early because I counted already 10 questions for you. <laughs> okay. So we have some time for some discussions. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the questions. Um, if anyone from, from the audience want to want to jump in, feel free to also unmute yourself all. Still, please write in the chat. Um, so, so far we have one question from the audience. Oh, just a second, popped up. Um, so is cluster API a Kubernetes orchestrator? Feels like an inception concept on orchestrator to manage another orchestrator. <laughs> so, is it a Kubernetes orchestrator? Maybe I would have to look up the exact definition or how, how, did, how would you define orchestrator? But in the end, cluster API is inside, so, so it's running completely inside Kubernetes. So it's kind of Kubernetes managing Kubernetes. So it's not building an additional orchestrator. It is just having logic that was there before already just very provider specific and making it more generic and making it more reusable. That's how I would put it. Um, at the end of the day, sure, you could argue it's an orchestrator for an orchestrator, but you somehow need to manage your Kubernetes clusters. And therefore, I, I would say maybe it is. Maybe it is an orchestrator. I don't, <laughs> I, I can't exactly define it. Yeah, actually, we have one question related to that. Um, so Adam asked, that's the question related to, to Magnus' question. Is the name, do you think the name is good? On the, and it, it feels a very vague name and maybe doesn't really tell anything about what it does. Is the name good? Um, naming is always one of the hardest problems in anything ever. <laughs> so sure. I don't think the name is great. Um, I can agree that it is confusing when you get into it, you, you read cluster API. And if you just take the words cluster API, it could be anything, right? It could be an API to clusters and you just query something. Um, and therefore it's, it's maybe not ideal. The problem is I could also not come up with a better name for what it's actually doing. <laughs> so in that case, I can agree it's not the greatest name. But then I would also say, I can't come up with a better name. And therefore, I'm kind of stuck with this. Um, that, that would be my take on it for now. Mm -hmm. Adam, feel free to propose something. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> if you have a great <laughs> idea of what to call a cluster yeah. API, I would be okay. open to hear it. Yeah. Um, another question. Uh, do you, can you give any suggestions for getting started on a local cluster, maybe, with cluster API? Sure. Um, I can maybe share my screen in a, in a moment again. Um, so uh, 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 let, me, let me try and share my screen really quickly and share the correct screen as well. So Cluster API has this book, um, which you can find at cluster-api.6.kts.io. When you just Google Cluster API Kubernetes, you will also find this. Um, and in this book, there's, for example, a quick start guide. And in the quick start guide, you will find um, instructions how to also set this up locally using kind, for example. And with kind, you will be able to set up the management cluster locally, so on your own machine. And you will also be able to um, maybe set it up with Docker locally. So you can run cluster API completely locally. And you can follow these uh, getting started guides here quite easily. It gets a little bit more intense the more you scroll down obviously so you can initialize and then down here you can once again choose like what do you want to initialize for and then you can choose docker for example to run it locally and the end-to-end um, -end tests within uh, cluster api are also run with the docker provider so therefore they're also running locally 
but this is, uh, I would say, a good place to start because it's a very thorough description and it gives you the option to choose different providers. So maybe you have an AWS account and you just want to try it out against AWS. Cool, thank you. Okay, um, next question. How would you solve running a single application across several cloud providers? Which solution would you recommend for load balancing on top? <laughs> for load balancing on top? Whew. Okay. Um, so if you have an application which is running in multiple cloud providers and first of all for me the question would be is it necessary for the application to be aware on which cloud provider it is if not then it becomes a lot easier um, if yes then things get increasingly harder from there so let's assume it's not necessary then I would say you don't even need to bother with cluster API at that point, because the application should be contained without, within Kubernetes without necessarily knowing about anything about the outside world. What you then really need is some kind of orchestrator in front of your Kubernetes clusters. And I think someone in chat is already mentioning it. There's multiple different solutions to do this. There are, maybe you can use some CDN. Um, I know people use Akamai, for example to orchestrate on, in front of multiple Kubernetes clusters, which are also running in different cloud providers. Uh, therefore, there are different solutions than cluster API. And cluster API is more concerned about managing the lifecycle of your cluster than managing how traffic gets to your cluster. That is not necessarily what cluster API is concerned about. I hope that answers the question. Makes sense, yeah. Um, Daniel, you had your uh, hand raised. Do you want to ask a question? <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Uh, thanks, Marcel, for the presentation. It was really awesome. Um, one question I have regarding the uh, Prometheus stack, for example, or so, for example, when you provision a cluster initially, mm -hmm. you want to install additional stuff like the Prometheus stack, Grafana, and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and potentially like a logging uh, tooling, right? Mm -hmm. Um, how, what is your recommendation on on this approach? How sh how would we would what's the best approach to install this stuff with the cluster in the cluster API concept, so to speak? Okay. Um, currently in cluster API, I, I would need to look up how exactly it's called. There's a way to run certain um, tasks or scripts like directly after the cluster has been created. So this would be one way, for example, to install the CNI. Usually when you do this kind of stuff though, um, you will run into the problem that once you have the CNI, you also want to keep it updated and so on. And you run into this whole, you need application management basically on top of your cluster. Um, there are several different approaches for now, but cluster API kind of guards itself from expanding its scope too much. So cluster API does not deal natively with any um, application management. It is solely happy as soon as the Kubernetes API says, I'm happy. Um, and therefore, all these additional solutions will need to be installed in some other way. I can tell you how we in Giant Swarm do it, and then I can hopefully give you some recommendations on how other people do it. Uh, we in Giant Swarm have basically built our own managed apps platform that reacts on Kubernetes cluster objects being created and then takes care of installing them. So we have our own operator that then installs Helm charts in specific clusters, for example, and manages the Prometheus in these clusters. Um, that's then a different operator. A different approach could be um, setting up um, GitOps tooling with your cluster and letting it be managed through GitOps. This can be done, for example, in, in most GitOps solutions, you can have one set of configuration pointing at several different clusters or like several different clusters pull from the same configuration. Therefore, the only concern you would then have is the initial setup of your GitOps tooling, like for example, installing Argo CD in your cluster, which I believe is possible through cluster APIs like this post install, uh, uh, install situation. In general, this is not a 100% solved um, problem for now in cluster API, because once again, cluster API kind of does the cutoff point at Kubernetes is running, everything else is your problem. <laughs> That's like kind of the cluster API approach currently for, for the scope of the project. 
um, and therefore multiple different managed providers also do it differently. I hope this yeah. answers I the thought, question. I thought it has this concept of add-ons or something like this. Um, let me let me look up what exactly. So the way currently we are using Flux V2 yes. to provision the, the rest of the stuff, like what's not Grafana, Prometheus, and logging stack, what's not related to this, mm -hmm. we use uh, Flux V2. But uh, in the rest, um, we mm -hmm. were looking for an alternative, like an so, add-ons approach. Um, if you can see my screen, this is what I'm talking about basically right now. So there's this cluster resource set definition. And a cluster resource set is basically um, a way to automatically apply a set of resources defined by users to newly created or existing clusters. This is what I was referring to. Um, right. In theory, um, cluster API is extendable in, in whichever way you want. Um, therefore, yeah, I'm, I'm not certain about add-ons right now or how add-ons would be defined. Most of these yeah. are kind of open source solutions that work on top of the cluster API um, definitions. So on the generic types, I would have to look it up, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Daniel, you have any more questions? Thank you. Okay, yeah. then we have a next I... question from the audience. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Uh, thanks for the, for the great presentation. Uh, you mentioned briefly about uh, the support or early alpha from uh, like Microsoft, uh, Google, and uh, Tanzu guys. Um, can you expand a little bit of what is the incentive of using this and who is actually this use? Like, okay. um, who is this one for in these early stages? Yeah, so um, there is a lot of movement from uh, VMware, Red Hat, and Microsoft, mainly from what I see um, upstream. Um, the main in incentive is just um, they want to basically define this well upstream so they can use it for their own managed platforms. So the long-term vision, for example, um, try to pull this up really quickly. Um, oh. Is my audio still fine? Yeah, we sort of lost oh, you for just... a second, but it's good. OK. <laughs> um, I can also try and pull this up. So from Microsoft, for example, there is a blog post announcing cluster API involvement um, in favor of um, um, their EKS solution or long-term favor of their EKS solution. Let me try and find this really quickly in the meantime. So the biggest incentive for them is to um, replace their current very provider specific um, cluster management solutions that they have with um, a more generalized upstream solution that they then can expand on with their specific stuff. What they're kind of aiming for is to have a higher adoption rate, obviously, of managed Kubernetes solutions. So let me just quickly share my screen here to show yeah. you And maybe screen. additional question like Google is pushing with Antos with the multi-cloud stuff. And um, I don't know, maybe yeah. someone else. Um, how this, uh, how cluster API works in congestion with, with uh, on-prem stuff and uh, maybe private clouds, some other okay. stuff? Yeah. So um, first of all, this is, the blog post I was referring to in 2020, it's basically um, Microsoft announcing their um, higher involvement in cluster API. You will find similar blog posts for VMware and Tanzu. Um, in general, for cluster API and the cross uh, cloud um, capabilities, you can also find a list of providers. And there are providers for different on-premise um, solutions as well. So as you can see here, these are the infrastructure providers. And here you can find, for example, OpenStack, vSphere, um, Metal3 is also on-premise and um, what's the company called? Um, the previously Packet, um, what are they called now again? Equinix. Equinix, yeah. Equinix. Equinix is also working um, on a uh, cluster API provider 
um, for their on-premise solution. So what you can see here is while Google is doing this, it's in my opinion, doing this kind of in a bubble away from the other cloud provider and on-premise providers. While Anthos is in my belief, very cool, like most Google products are, um, it is no longer as aligned with the Kubernetes upstream as Google previously were. Um, you can have a lot of discussions like why Google is moving away from this, but uh, there's a lot of gossip about that as well. Um, but the general consensus here seems to be that cluster API is more of the other cloud providers, namely VMware, um, Azure, and to an extent um, AWS, in addition to several different on-premise providers that are trying to push this. Does this answer your question? Or uh, yeah, thank you. Packet, Packet was what it's called. It's now Equinix Metal, I believe, yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. So let's see. Um, Adam had a question. Um, is there more of a future for cluster API when we have previous attempts that are still being maintained like KOps and Cube Spray? Is this just going to be dropped when the next one comes along? <laughs> this is a very, very spicy question. I would say. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, qualify that by just saying I'm not trying to be negative. It's just no, I've no, used no, all three okay. of those, and yeah. I can, I can feel your pain. Um, I can definitely relate to what you're saying. Let's put it like this. Um, so obviously there is a, um, th there is some kind of negativity involved here, um, not from your side, but like in general in the community because there have been multiple solutions. And if you read the news, like the last few days, there was a different uh, uh, provider also coming out with their own uh, solution for this. Um, why I'm kind of talking about cluster API here is because I believe that this is finally an attempt that is not driven by a small subset of the community or by a single provider, um, which makes it different to the previous attempts in my personal opinion, because here bigger providers have a vested interest in making this successful. And this was also kind of part why Kubernetes became successful. It, it didn't necessarily became successful because a single person started the Kubernetes project and then all the cloud providers decided to, to move on with it. But multiple big cloud providers decided to push it and decided to put resources in it. And I see the same thing happening with cluster API. So you will see in cluster API currently full-time employed employees from, for example, Microsoft, VMware, and Red Hat solely working on cluster API. And therefore, that gives it, in my opinion, a stronger community and a stronger backbone to be successful in the future. I cannot necessarily talk about Cube Spray and how maintained it was. Um, but if you, for example, read the cluster API motivation in their book, they also clearly state that Cluster API is an iteration on Cube ADM, for example, where the big flaw they identified was that Cube ADM only really takes care of initially setting up your cluster and then doing the other actions kind of semi manually, while Cluster API tries to encompass the whole cluster management. Therefore, could it be a thing where in two years we never talk about Cluster API again? Yes. Could it be something where we continue to see it and we see the strong community support? That's kind of what I'm hoping for because bigger players are involved and are not afraid to spend greater amount of resources to make it successful. That would be my take on it, but <laughs> it can all go, it can all go wrong. <laughs> and then I eat my words, obviously. That's that's fair. Um, the only exposure I had to it thus far was the OpenStack provider, and I yeah. don't know if there's if there is a, a custodian or a maintainer. I know I know the provider exists. I'm just not sure if there's a company backing it or if it's just contributors. Yeah. Because I know that the COPS uh, development was best effort because mm -hmm. nobody effectively owned the OpenStack yeah. provider in Chaos. So I'm I'm wondering if a similar sort of fate uh, might yeah. exist for Cluster API. Obviously, this, is, this, this becomes more complicated if you talk about not the Cluster API project as a whole, but the different providers. And there I can see it happening for sure. So for example, um, there is a Tencent provider, which was pushed by Tencent themselves um, in kind of Cluster API version, Alpha 1, Alpha 2, 
and then they kind of dropped support from it, um, which is unfortunate, obviously. But there you can see then kind of at least a part of cluster API being left behind when no one is there to pick it up really, or just the community picks it up. And let's be real, uh, most of the Kubernetes upstream contributors are currently in the Western hemisphere and are not natively Tencent users. So then there's no one to pick up the flame necessarily. Um, so this can happen to individual parts of cluster API. I just know that the major three are currently strongly supported. So um, VMware, different on-premise solutions, and then um, AWS and Azure. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so a couple of questions from my side as well. Uh, you sort of already answered that, um, but maybe a few more a few more words on how would you compare or um, well, I'm, I, I know the answer to that question, but I just want to know your opinion. Like, um, why would you use cluster API instead of just using Terraform and Kubespray, for example? Yeah, so um, mostly because with uh, Terraform and Kubespray, you don't get a full cluster lifecycle management. Um, you get an easy setup and you get an easy cluster running. But as soon as it goes to really operating the cluster and keeping it alive over a long period of time, so we're not talking about a month now, we're talking about multiple years where it has to go through different Kubernetes versions and so on. Um, it's really insufficient in, in, in the way it manages clusters in that regard, where cluster API tries to provide like the full cluster lifecycle management from you start the cluster, you upgrade the cluster, you delete the cluster over whichever time span it takes and also scaling it up, scaling it down and so on. Um, that's why I see the major difference. That's not to say that Kubespray is bad or that any other solution is bad. It's just from our experience, if you, if you manage a lot of Kubernetes clusters and you manage them for a long time, um, these problems just amplify a lot and therefore it becomes very hard to deal with. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, are there any big advantages or would you recommend to use um, cluster API even if the company is on one cloud provider and is not planning to move? Let's be honest here, you, you're on one cloud provider, you're not planning to move. There's no deep incentive to not use the cloud provider provided managed solution. I would mm -hmm. not advise you or force you or tell you you need to go to cluster API in such a case because it just realistically maybe doesn't make too much sense. Um, this is under the assumption that you're honest with yourself and you will be on one cloud provider for a long time <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. and so on. Because what happens a lot is organizations tend to not be very honest with themselves. And then you run into problems when you then suddenly figure out, oh shit, we need to go to three cloud providers. And now you've made a decision in the past that is very restrictive. Mm. Okay. Um... Is there any policy enforcement mechanism in Cluster API? Like what if I don't want Team X to spun up more than X nodes, for example? So currently there's no strong policy enforcement there. Um, but thankfully, because it's all Kubernetes resources, um, so you're just creating CRs, you can restrict access to the CRs and you can do it with the normal Kubernetes mechanisms. And therefore, Cluster API doesn't try to impose on you. Um, so you could just restrict the namespace or restrict which ac uh, actions uh, people can actually do. Um, that, is, that is normally possible through Kubernetes. Um, there's currently no real upstream way to, to lock this enforcement down more. You can solve it through any webhook maybe you, you want as well, like OPA or Kiverno if you have the need. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um... And you mentioned uh, as well, yeah, you've been talking about, for example, deploying stuff afterwards in the cluster, like Prometheus or something. Uh, what about stuff that, in, let's say, integrates with the cluster, like um, Istio, Cilium, like so, some mm -hmm. other networking stuff? Uh, would you also manage that separately, or is this something that that cluster API would or, or supposed to manage? So currently, it's something you would manage separately. Um, there's some discussion going upstream on whether this is the right way or the wrong way. So if you have, <laughs> obviously, if anyone has any strong opinions there, that, that's a good way to get involved. Um, but it's not an easy question to answer, right? You can have very different viewpoints on this, sure, um, yeah. as well as like the CNI, like should this CNI be a part of like your cluster setup initially, or is it something you want to manage externally? Um, 
all of these are questions which are very hard to answer. The current upstream way is to not include them in cluster API and to leave them to the provider or to the person uh, running the Kubernetes cluster in the end to figure out, to kind of limit the scope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I don't have any more questions. Anyone okay. else from the audience? Last minute questions? No. I think that's a no. So tell us, Marcel, how, how, how you feel? I feel good. Um, <laughs> I feel a little bit exhausted from talking so much, <laughs> yeah. but that's, I think, the, the normal. Um, but yeah, all good. I'm, I'm kind of excited about Cluster API and the general way it's going. So that's why I'm very happy to talk about it uh, quite frequently, because I just think it's, uh, it's an exciting project to be involved in if you manage Kubernetes clusters or if you have to do a lot of Kubernetes clusters. Um, and therefore, it's quite exciting to me. But I can understand that it's maybe not as exciting to everyone else, <laughs> to some others. No, definitely. I think there's definitely a need for for tool like that. Um, if the cluster API is the one, because I mean, the problem is definitely there. So if the cluster API is the one to solve it, then I'm also not sure about it, but it's definitely look, looks promising. I've been also yeah. following, following it for a while. Yeah, exactly. And the, the problem is kind of it's hard to tell uh, which is going to be the one, right? The community mm -hmm. can be very fickle sometimes. So that, that's kind of my reasoning behind at least there's money in it, there's uh, companies in, involved. But mm -hmm. yeah, if you think about um, just not so much in the past, we we're talking about case net and different solutions about how to template things. And the community has diverged so much. And it's like, changing so quickly in the uh, Kubernetes space that it's hard to predict what's going to come, what's going to go. Mm, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. If there are no more questions, then I hope we'll see you sometime in the future when you'll be talking about first uh, 1.0 release, maybe. Hopefully, hopefully yeah. soon. We'll see how it goes upstream. Okay. Then, um, Thank you very much to everyone. Um, and yeah, link will be uh, sent to you. And if you have anything for us, or if you have any propositions for the talks, also feel free to send it to us. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.